Hello. Hello. How are you? Very well, thanks. Hello. How's it going? Good, good. So David is the Director of Infrastructure and Workspace at Global, who's going to talk to us about the journey that you're going on. You've got a couple of really good insights for us today. So those of you who don't know Global who've joined us, I'll, I'll let David do the introduction, but you probably listened to them in some way, shape or form this morning. We'll do um, a short Q&A at the end if anybody's got any questions, um, and then we'll read out how you contact David um, also after this webinar. But, but to be honest with you, with further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to David. Great. Thanks, Andy, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I'll just, uh, as, as he suggests, I'll just start with a quick introduction to, to Global. Um, we're, we're a media and entertainment company uh, uh, owned and based here in the UK. We uh, operate primarily a number of radio stations that you might be familiar with, but we're also expanding into other markets as well. So we've got around about 31 million people who interact with us in some shape or form. Uh, the vast majority of that being through our, our radio stations. Um, so the Heart Network has got 9.5 million listeners. Capital Network has got over 8 million listeners. And we've got Classic FM and Smooth with over 5 million listeners each as well. Um, in addition to that, we, are, um, we have a couple of TV channels, um, Heart TV and Capital TV. Uh, and we also uh, recently moved into the live festival business. So we've acquired a number of independent festivals, and we now sell over a million festival tickets a year for our festivals, uh, which are all over the UK and actually a couple abroad as well. Um, one of them is called Snow Bombing, which uh, happens out in Austria and Canada. Um, the, as well as that, we've also got our own um, we've got our own school, the Global Academy, which is a, a secondary school out in West London where we. Uh, try and bring uh, people into the media and entertainment in industry with the relevant skills. Um, we find it really difficult to recruit good people. Um, I'm sure that's a challenge everyone on this call faces. So one of the things we're trying to do there is to address that at the education stage. And we've also uh, we've got our own charity, which is um, part of the organisation called Globals Make Some Noise. We make millions of pounds every year for um, for, for that charity, which helps. Um, primarily children um, in, in difficult circumstances in the UK. So that's a quick taster of, of, of Global. Um, we're privately owned. We've, um, we've come about through a lot of mergers and acquisitions, which has presented its own, uh, own challenges. Um, and as a result of that, we've picked up um, a reasonably, um, a, a, going back a little while, a reasonably significant technical debt of applications uh, and, and of infrastructure um, through all of those mergers and acquisitions. And we've been working on a program over the last few years to try and reduce the risk and complexity of, uh, of our technology stack. Uh, and, and part of the solution there has been the migration to cloud, which is obviously one of the, um, one of the, well, the main topic, really, that uh, I was going to proposing to talk about today. Um, so you know, the objective of the program was to, as I mentioned, re reduce the risk and complexity. Uh, of our traditional solutions, but also develop um, capability for, for digital growth. Um, at the moment, about 8% of all radio listening is, is online, um, be that through phones or uh, internet connected radios or increasingly now smart speakers. So um, that's a relatively small piece of the pie. Obviously, that means 92% of radio listening is through a traditional radio, be that you know FM or DAB or whatever. Um, but that, that that li listening online is going to grow, and we need to be able to support that growth uh, from our infrastructure. That growth presents a number of fantastic opportunities for us around personalization. Um, we can get a lot more money out of a personalized commercial, uh, much like any other digital business can. Um, where, and also we've got opportunities around personalization of content, so we can um, make the, the, the actual content of the, the audio that you're listening to more relevant to you. Um, so that's that's a fantastic opportunity, but to do that is difficult. Um, we're trying to anticipate what future digital growth might be, and we're trying to um, obviously keep up with some of the really big players in in digital advertising, um, the Googles and Facebooks of this world, which uh, which is also exciting. Um, actually, I'll just mention on the smart speaker, which is um, obviously over the last sort of 12 months has been uh, pretty amazing growth. I'd be I'm surprised if everyone on this call hasn't got a smart speaker of some shape or form, um, given that I'm assuming everyone's from a sort of fairly technical background. Um, I just thought I'd share this with you. This is the um, listening hours that we've been getting through just the Amazon Alexa, so we're not including the, the Google or, or Apple offerings here. This is just through Amazon Alexa. Um, and as you can see, a lot of people got a smart speaker for Christmas. If you, you can probably see where the Christmas Day spike is there. That trend, incidentally, has continued to grow. We're only showing up to the end of the year, but that just, just through December of last year. 
um, we saw pretty phenomenal growth and it's actually more than doubled since, since then. Um, so we're trying to, to deliver that, we're trying to deliver both the live streaming of the audio but also all of the um, all of the personalization insertion that underpins that which is um, which is quite quite exciting. Um, one of our recent developments has been a, um, an, a, a sort of an umbrella app for all of our radio brands to sit underneath so um, we've called it the global player it's available now in the iOS and Android store and uh, basically it's a single place that you can go to to um, consume all of our radio brands and, and other digital content. So you, you go open the app and then you can swipe through all the different stations across Radio X, across Smooth, um, and across Hearts. And then when you choose the one you want, you can um, dive into there. So if we just sort of pop across the capital here and jump in there. So now you'd be listening. I can't share audio on this presentation, but you wouldn't then be able to hear me talk anyway. So we're now listening to the live stream. And but if I choose that I don't actually like this song, I want to break out of the live stream. I'm able to um, go to what we call the My Capital, which is where you're now in com complete control. So this is a bit more like a sort of a Spotify type experience where um, you're you're getting personalised music playlists. But the playlists are curated uh, by us and therefore not quite like Spotify, it's much more like a radio experience in that we're suggesting the songs, you've got the option to skip the ones you don't like, but of course it's learning what you like and dislike over time so that will then become tailored to you. But at any time you can dive back into the live radio experience and importantly to make it more like a radio experience we insert non-music content like presenter links, um, maybe some we can insert travel or news um, like based on where you are, we can uh, obviously insert commercials which is important for us to make any money um, and so that's all, all going on in, in these apps and one of the things I wanted to talk about today really was how we've adopted cloud to uh, provide the platform for this app um, and, and also all of our uh, other digital offerings. Um, we've been a relatively early adopter of cloud um, and that's you know, had its benefits, but it's also its challenges. To be honest, uh, we, you know, maybe the risk is going in too early. You you don't have all the experience, and therefore you make a few mistakes along the way. But um, when we've certainly done that, and hold our hands up to it, we we actually started off our sort of cloud journey using some in, some internal. Um, sort of business systems rather than the consumer facing stuff uh, which is probably a good idea because if you're going to have any pains with any new technology you don't really want to do that in front of your, your consumers but um, what it meant was that we we chose a very high profile project around our, um, our, our basic our sales process uh, part of our sales process the planning system um, and that was um, a, some, it's a product which is still in existence, it's a very successful product for us now but it was quite a long journey getting there because we made some, some mistakes along the way, we perhaps chose the wrong cloud platform and then the, we were really started off by just building a fairly traditional infrastructure that we would have had on premise but in the cloud so we didn't initially leverage the benefits. We've learned from that, with that that's now a very successful product and the platform is really stable, supports us well and it's importantly it's really well tuned and optimised both from a performance and a cost perspective. So um, that was good and that, that um, experience has helped us then move forward um, with a fresh start on some of the consumer facing applications. The challenge we've had, uh, other challenges we've had really is that um, costs um, are particularly hard to project on uh, on any of this consumer facing stuff because we don't know what the demand is going to be. We don't know how many people are going to um, go out and buy an Amazon Alexa or how many people are going to download the app rather than listening on their car radio or what have you. So um, it's, that, that's, that's great. That means cloud is a really good solution for us because of the scalability but it's challenging when trying to build business cases um, around costs because it gets really complicated really quickly. Um, the other challenge we have, which is perhaps um, not particularly unusual, but uh, you know we get really spiky demand, um, and I'm sure yeah, people will be familiar with obviously different times of the day, different um, consumers want to do different things. Um, we, we've got a fairly uh, recognisable sort of uh, listening profile through the day. People, we know when people will tend to listen to the radio, and actually we'll know when they'll tend to listen via traditional radio, or whether they'll tend to, tend to listen via an app or, or via the website or what have you, um, because that's fairly repeatable. But we do get, um, even within, the, within an hour, we get very spiky demand. And part of the reason for that is the way that the apps are, are working and 
to the apps are calling things. Um, but the other challenge that we have is that almost all radio programs begin and end at the top of the hour. So, you know, there's almost always a news bulletin at the top of the hour, uh, and then the um, uh, yeah, and then the program follows it, and then we'll get back to the news. And the result of that is that there's a change on every single radio station at the top of every single hour. And there's a huge amount of com computation that has to go on at that point to change all of the metadata, to stop and restart uh, audio streams or, or um, transcoding. All sorts of things have to go on, and so um, that creates a lot of difficulty for us in terms of uh, how we how we build the infrastructure. Um, fortunately for us, we, 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 uh, we're using the um, AWS platform, um, and obviously Amazon have um, recently changed some of their um, some of their billing so that you can uh, you don't have to buy per hour anymore. You can now now buy per second, which allows us a bit of flexibility to spin things up around the top of the hour and shut them down very quickly afterwards um, in in the auto scaling. So there there are ways around it, but it's a it's a particular challenge for us and um, one that we have to manage. Um, so as I mentioned, we're, these, these consumer-facing uh, products are built in AWS on a, on a scalable Linux-based platform. We're using the auto-scaling groups um, to, to cope with, with the growing uh, and decreasing demand throughout the, the day or the hour. And then we've used microservices uh, wherever possible to do tasks. So things like transcoding audio is a really good example. Um, that microservices are really good for that, but also just working the internal message bus. Um, that's a re another really uh, good application for, for some of those um, Lambda functions. Um, we've taken a, uh, as I was talking about cost a bit earlier, we've taken a hybrid approach to how we actually serve the media. So the audio files, um, some of the audio files are served directly out of AWS. Um, but all of our live streaming and um, some of the other media is served from our own um, our own colo um, uh, facilities. We've, um, we're a member of the London Internet Exchange, and we we peer with uh, a large number of major ISPs. Um, and as a result, we're able to serve quite significant amounts of of, uh, of audio at much lower cost rather than doing it through through AWS. There are things that it's good to do out of AWS, so you know, we can do some of the caching and some of the CDN type um, work on things like commercials, um, but the, some of the live live audio can't really be cached, so um, the best approach for us was, was this hybrid method. Um, and that's kind of good. It obviously it increases your complexity, but it, it does at the same time um, provides really significant cost benefits. So, you know, in terms of the, just, just the data egress cost alone, you know, probably manage to do about a tenth of the price of what we pay AWS. Um, we have very, very strictly enforced tagging and reasonably large amount of automation um, around how the environments are deployed, how um, things are um, started up and shut down. Um, and actually, this is something that uh, that ANS helped us with recently, with which is to make sure that um, the tagging is robustly enforced, and any, anything incorrectly tagged gets basically gets shut down. Um, the the benefit of this has been primarily around cost management and cost optimization. We're able to see which which, um, which instances are um, serving which environments. We were able to see which uh, we see where the cost is, what time of day the cost is from from where. Um, and we we enforce tagging both very strictly both on the um, on the environment tag and also the product tag so that we can understand uh, across the probably 12 to 15 products that we've now got in in AWS where the uh, where the cost is coming from. So that's been pretty good and it's allowed us to automate quite a lot of things around um, around cost optimization as well. Um, so. Uh, that's kind of a bit of an overview. I haven't gone yet into too much technical detail. Um, I'm not a developer or, or um, you know, I'm not particularly an architect myself. My background is in broadcast engineering and um, probably a third of my team are broadcast engineers as well. But um, I, I can, if, if there are questions about it, have a stab at explaining a bit more detail on the on the actual infrastructure itself that we use under the bonnet. Um, or if people prefer, I talk more about the products, how they work, um, or, or, sort of, or global sort of wider strategy. Um, so maybe this might be a good opportunity to pause and see if anyone wants to throw in some questions, and then that might help me work out what, what else you want me to talk about. No problem at all. So I've got a quick one, if that's okay, to kick it off, David. Yeah. Is that right? So, um, your traditional competition, I suppose, you will be fighting with the traditional broadcasting corporations, 
Um, do you see Spotify as a big target of competition where you could maybe, you, you know, get some of those users out of there? Is that is that a, a strategy for you guys? Is is the streaming players a, a different angle? Just talk to us a little bit about that, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So the the traditional um, competitors to to us would would you right be well? There's two two elements to it. There's competition for the audience, and then there's competition for the advertisers. For the audience, obviously, the the, the biggest broadcaster in the UK is the BBC, and they're extremely well resourced and can put some fantastic programming out. And as a result, they they take a very large chunk of the the radio listening um, uh, at the moment. Um, but then there are other radio, commercial radio groups who, who we compete with for, for airtime, um, and, and and have have always done so. The um, the uh, sort of the the new income, the new entrance into the marketplace, be that your, your Spotify's or um, stream, other streaming services, podcasts, etc. That's more uh, competition for, for for airtime as well. Although what we've tended to see is that that has just increased the overall amount of audio consumption and um, our amount of audio consumption had, it continues to grow very slowly. So that's um, how the market's growing effectively? The whole market's growing. Yeah. So our, our piece of the pie perhaps is getting smaller, but the pie itself is getting much bigger. So yeah. overall, that doesn't concern us um, at the moment. Um, but we, we do need to re remain innovative. And so we need to look at what Spotify is doing and provide maybe some, some what for example what i showed you earlier which you know we think is a kind of a, a best of uh, taking the best of radio and taking the best of spotify to provide kind of a middle ground um, experience and what we benefit from obviously is our well established brands that have been around for years and everyone understands they know what they're getting if they listen to capital or if they listen to heart or if they listen to classic fm so um we've got that that benefit and, and we hope that by remaining innovative we, c we can keep hold of that ear time and in terms of the the other other element really which is obviously for, for the advertiser to spend um, that is that remains really challenging for us to, to, to keep in front there obviously the, there's some very large players in Google and Facebook in, in advertising now and they're able to offer some extremely impressive um, scale uh, but again we've got some um, great brands we've got um, a number of uh, a number of really uh, attractive propositions to advertisers and so again our piece of the pie is shrinking but we're still managing to grow our revenues um, both organically through innovative um, um, selling and also through through some m a as well but um, we're you know we're able to bring in uh, we're able to bring in money and uh, and we're able to do some of the personalized advertising which is kind of where a lot of the, a lot of the more organic growth is coming from because um, we're able to, to target a commercial to an individual so you, you know you and I could be listening to the same radio station but um, because you're in Manchester and I'm in London but perhaps we'd hear a different version and perhaps my browser yeah. history says I'm interested in buying um, you know, clothes for my kids, and you're interested in buying a new car. Then, you know, obviously the ads will get tailored. There you go. So that sort of programmatic advertising is um, a, a growth area, and we are able to benefit from it. So, work from an analytics perspective. Which is your most piece of valuable analytics that you say you guys perform, and how do you overcome the challenges of, of that? Well, the analytics has been really difficult traditionally in radio because there's never previously been a back channel. Um, it's been a one-way broadcast, and you hope that someone is listening basically yeah. um, so the benefits we've got now are that with the, with the online listening albeit only eight percent of the overall uh, listening at the moment is we get that back channel immediately and one of the things we've done uh, in this new app um, and to be able to get all this advanced functionality like the my the, the uh, the my capital functionality for example is you have to be a, you have to be a logged in listener so yeah, our, yeah. our analytics data that we then get through you know, having access to your facebook account or, or your google account or what have you um that that will uh, that is invaluable to us um because that's the that's what we can monetize with the advertisers great stuff so i've got a quick question actually if that's all right you mentioned yeah. briefly on the phone it's from uh, nick um you made the wrong choice of cloud provider initially um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? And that's suppose a little bit of advice to people. That might, it might not be that it was a bad platform. It might just be the wrong type of platform. But could you talk a little bit about that, David? Yeah, I mean, so basically we, we started off in, in Azure with um, with this internal um, business system I, I was mentioning earlier. Um, uh, but we're, you know, we're going back 
I don't know, six or seven years now. So the, the, the platforms were all immature at the time, Azure especially. Yeah. So I think we basically, we, because we were building that particular product on, on a Microsoft stack with Microsoft SQL uh, and, and so forth, we, we, we decided to, to go with Azure, but actually the, the platform at the time wasn't ready for it. I think we'd be absolutely fine doing it now, but we're quite yeah. happy how it works in AWS. We do use Azure, I should mention, and actually it's pr primarily for that data analytics piece, the, um, the data warehousing um, tool. And in fact, that, um, if I was back to that Alexa slide, that, that yeah. comes out of our analytics platform, which is built on, on Azure and uh, using Power BI and things. Yeah, why was that? Was that a skills thing or traditional or familiarity? Um, it was, uh, well, because we had a large amount of Microsoft SQL in place, um, yeah. it, was, it was a good starting point. Um, and also, to be brutally honest, um, Microsoft kindly funded quite a lot of the initial development oh, on this, or the planning on it through, through, through one of their partners. So, yeah, um, always helps. yeah, that always helps. And, you know, that's, a, that's obviously a smart selling strategy for anyone. Well, especially if you, if you, you know, when you talked before about it's very difficult to build a business case, isn't it, for something that you don't really know. Um, yeah, so what's the, so can I talk a little bit about the culture of global then? So you, you've made some transition, you're a very early adopter. Did you see high rates of staff turnover? Did you see a great cultural adoption? Was it, were people wary of it? How did they adapt internally? And how has global changed organizationally, certainly in the departments that you've worked in in that period to sort of get the best use out of modern tech? Um, so the yeah, cultural global is really interesting, um, especially as I mentioned, because it's come about through a lot of M&A. So you kind of smash a number of cultures together. But that yeah. said, the, the core technology, um, well, the team that I run, the sort of technology operations, infrastructure um, and, and workspace is an extremely stable team, actually really lucky. Uh, I've got an average length of service of about 10 years, just under 10 years. Right. Uh, and I've had people in the company, well, actually, someone's going to get hit their 40-year um, anniversary next February. Oh, um, really? So, yeah, so, you know, we, we, we're, quite, we're quite lucky in that we've got a stable, stable team. And that does bring its challenges because inevitably, um, I will say I do have some, some you know, fresh, fresh, young, eager people as well. But, you know, so yeah. it's a balance. But I think, you know, 10-year average length of service is pretty good. Um, in, in, it, well, if, you want, if you want the people staying around, and, and I do in this case, <laughs> yeah. because they've got a lot of experience and knowledge. Um, yeah. The flip side is inevitably people will be sometimes a little bit more cautious with new tech compared to someone who, who's perhaps a bit, uh, you know, fresh in the door. Um, yeah. And so we did have some concerns, and and but some of those concerns were valid. You know, it, it, initially a lot of the talk about cloud was around cost, um, and and it you know it, it doesn't always make it cheaper. Uh, it provides other benefits. Um, but it, it you know we've 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 brought people around if they if they had concerns. Um, and we haven't, you know, lost too many people off the back of it. Um, as I mentioned, within my area, things are fairly stable. I know that the area we struggle most in is attracting and retaining good developers, and I'm sure we're not unique in that. It's obviously a very competitive marketplace, uh, and we find these sorts of people are much more um, likely to move on to a new project every couple of years or something. So, yeah. uh, so that's been really hard. In terms of how we organize ourselves, um, we've got a relatively traditional sort of infrastructure model for most in most cases but we if for this particular um, um, solution I've been talking about we move to a more DevOps type type model where where my team provide the deep underlying infrastructure support and then we allow the, the, the DevOps uh, guys to, to, to work on top of that but but we're kind of the gatekeepers so we're enforcing that tagging we're um, yeah. governance focused them. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, it's not heavy governance. We're, we're yeah. you know, just to give you a flavour of the, the sort of the size of the company, we've got about 1,500 full-time employees, and there's about 100 in technology, and that is everything from the broadcast engineers making the studios work and doing outside broadcasts, the IT support team, the infrastructure team, developers, project works, you know, all this kind of stuff. So it's not a huge team, and so the yeah. governance is kind of appropriate to the size of the team. But there's cool. things that we can enforce, um, and then there's things that that you know, we allow a little bit more flexibility on. Yeah, of course. Certainly, when you're sort of trying to foster a innovation, you don't really want to take the whole, the whole of traditional enterprise IT, do you? Which brings me to another sort of point of how are you, how are you attracting and, and how are you attracting the new talent? Have you got any sort of innovative ways that you find that work? And of course, there's a bit of advice for people on the call who are looking to recruit some of those new skills. What sort of advice could you give in, in, in sort of changing that culture or recruiting some of those new age skills in? 
Uh, well, a number of things really. Uh, so one is we've been running a graduate program for um, yeah. a few years now, and that's been really successful. We we have our, without doubt our most set success um, in in recruitment at a graduate level. Um, people are that we're quite lucky. People are uh, often you know enthusiastic about joining Global. They maybe recognise the brands. They yeah. want to get get close to, to music or festivals or celebrity or whatever it is. Um, and so that's that obviously attracts some people. And if we can get good grads in, um, they tend to be loyal. They tend to be really hardworking and good fun, actually. So that's been great. Brilliant. We've done a lot of work on diversity. Um, my boss, our, 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 um, our CIO, um, Dave Henderson, has uh, when he came in made a massive effort around um, diversity. I mean, most obviously gender diversity, which is always a problem in technology, but more generally than that so we we've we've made sure all hiring managers are trained on unconscious bias and making sure that we're um pulling together short lists with with diversity in um and that's really really contributed to a to a good working environment and then we do all sorts of other bits and pieces you might ex expect like you know um milk rounds and all this kind of stuff but it's not an, it's not easy and we've certainly not no. got it nailed and as I say, especially around to developers it's really really difficult and I think the, the thing it is it's a developer's market around. isn't it yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. absolutely it is so uh, talk to you a little bit about the festivals and that puts the, the what kind of pressure that puts on IT and what's the kind of move there what's the play there is is there something is a big growing area for you yeah the, so it is a big, big growing area in that in the last 18 to 24 months we had nothing and, and now we've got over a million tickets that we're selling a year. Um, the, 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 the play there is basically we bought up a number of independent festivals. So these, this is you know, a small team running one festival wherever it was and we've pulled together I think over 20 now. Um, so the result of that is uh, firstly that we can um, provide them some economy of scale by procurement of things like uh, ticketing, security, catering, etc., for these these large these large festivals, so we can save them some money. Um, we can also um, look at our sponsorship and advertising uh, and what we can do for them. So, can we, you know, sponsor a festival? Can we promote the festival on our radio station? So, there's quite a lot of opportunity to, to tie those up. Um, and then, from a technology point of view. The um, the best the best thing we can really offer. Well, so firstly, so we haven't fully integrated the festivals into our into our organisation yet because we don't own 100% of all of them yet. Um, yeah. So um, they are sort of held at arm's length, and we're in a sort of consultative capacity. Although we do provide a number of services to them, but the sort of the sort of um, help that we're giving them within technology is around looking at their ticketing platforms. You know, questions like is you know how how would blockchain um, help with ticketing, or would it um, looking at some interesting stuff around wearables. Um, so, you know, wearing uh, everyone at a festival wearing sort of an RFID wristband, uh, mm. that is their ticket and their method of payment. Um, but with that, we can obviously understand, you know, what people spend their money on at a festival, where, where they go, oh. what they're interested in. And even, you know, in some cases, manage, just manage capacity, you know, that it's the safety and security is, a, is our top priority at the festival. So not being able to tell where people are, um, making sure that certain areas don't get overcrowded and things is is is, is interesting. So I think wearables yeah, going to be really excited. That's something you know. If I had a bit more time, that's something I'd like to get more personally involved in. Uh, because alongside that and the work we're doing on the smart speakers, you know, this this new tech's really exciting uh, and it's all consumer facing, which is good as well. Yeah, of course. I was just going to going to wrap up with one question really, which was. With all the hype in the industry at the minute around AI, machine learning, wearables, IoT, which one do you think is, is the one that would apply to yourself and which one do you find that is going to provide the most transformative experience for your consumers? Is it, is it the wearables, do you think? Is it AI? I think it's probably the, it's probably the IoT, in the, if, if you can count a smart speaker as, as IoT, which I think is fair enough yeah. to do. Um, and you know, I think smart home and, most importantly, um, smart cars, um, because, of course, uh, a lot of radio listening happens in vehicle, and um, you know the connected to car um, and the competition on the dashboard is is a challenge. Uh, well, yeah. it's, a, it's an opportunity and and a threat to us really. Um, so that's I think that's what's going to create the most uh, excitement for us o over the coming coming years. Um, potentially AI, it, it, you know, it's certainly around the programmatic advertising field, uh, and they, yeah, you know, wearables perhaps more around the, the live festivals.
Yeah, definitely. So I just, I think I said that was my last one, but I just round off with the last one. Any advice for an organisation who's going through? You, you've, you've spent a good six, seven years there, maybe even longer, going through what, what the market would call digital transformation in how you actually touch customers, how you provide them with content, personalisation, and all the things that really wrap up digital. For somebody that's sort of getting into that now, maybe they've taken a role in a new organisation and they're looking at where to start. You know, what's the first thing to do? What sort of advice could you could you give someone who was who was put in that position? Um, well, the, the the best advice really for me is is try and keep it simple. So um, you know, we we started from a uh, reduced complexity and risk, and uh, and then often the answer to that is, is some form of digital transformation. But we we started from a point of it's really everything's really complicated. How can we how can we make it more simple? Um, and I think if you're always trying to make it make it make it less complex, um, that tends tends to work well. Yeah, and there's a lot of legacy in sort of traditional enterprise organisations and traditional change control and traditional ways of doing things, right? I suppose the way that you can sort of rationalise and consolidate some of that old complexity is one of the first places to start. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. Well, I think that, that round is up, unless there's any more questions. Um, well, I've had one coming from um, Mike who asks how to Brilliant. deal with the increase in adverts being delivered to you. Um, I'm not quite clear whether you mean the number of adverts being delivered to me as a consumer or to us as a as, a, as an organisation that's serving the adverts. Um, I'm guessing possibly the, as an organisation. Okay, yeah. So um, the well, we partner with um, some ad tech providers basically. So um, we for the traditional broadcast uh, commercials, we have an in-house team uh, which processes those and um, and distributes them for play out. Um, for the, um, the programmatic advertising uh, and the, the, the personalised advertising, we partner with some ad tech firms. Basically, um, and that's all much that's all automated. With that. um, the, the reason, that, one of the reasons why there has to be people involved in the broadcast uh, adverts is that there's a compliance element to it. We have to make sure that the commercial um, it meets a number of compliance con criteria before it can be broadcast. Um, like most things on the internet, it's a bit more wild west, and so we don't actually have to individually check every commercial, it can be automatically processed. I hope that answers the question. I don't know if there's any others, but Great. I don't see anyone I have. Direct. No, I won't. Brilliant. Well, David, I'd really like to thank you. How do people contact you? Do you mind people contacting you if they reached out to your email and maybe if there was something more? Yeah, that's you know, fine. That's I'm, just, okay. I'm, I'm about to go away on holiday, though, so if we could leave it a few days, <laughs> leave it a week before you bombard <laughs> yeah. me with emails, I'm david.holroyd at global.com. Brilliant stuff. Well, David, it's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you very much for taking half an hour every day to do it, and I hope everybody on the call found that informative. And I'd like to personally thank everyone who's joined us this morning and given the time up, um, and uh, hopefully I'll see everybody on the next webinar. Thanks again, David. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks.